you so much for inviting me and for organizing such an amazing conference. And um, I should preface this by saying that this comes out of research I'm doing as an art history student at Queens, but really it comes out of several years of working in artist-run centers, so it's, it's um, from my work. Artist-run centers were set up as alternatives to museums and private galleries. Today they're vibrant community spaces which produce and display some of the most important artistic output in Canada, much of which eventually comes to represent the nation on an international level. I've noticed that over time and following changes in administrative policy at a national level, that the language employed by funding bodies has shifted radically. I believe that the changes in the language of grants directly affects the language of the centers themselves, who, in order to access the funding necessary to continue their activities, which includes paying a living wage to artists for their work, are absorbed by the rhetoric of the government. In her latest book, Capitalism, A Ghost Story, Arundhati Roy demonstrates how private corporations exert political power through the funding of philanthropic foundations. The Canada Council for the Arts is not a philanthropic foundation. It's an arm's reach crown corporation that receives funding from the Canadian government. However, a similar process is at play here. The Canadian government funds the Canada Council, and by extension, more local arts councils, and they in turn fund the artist-run centers. The government exerts political power through its funding processes. In doing so, they effectively decide what constitutes art and curb individual artist-run centers' ability to risk programming work, which might be radical, anti-institutional, or critical of the government. The problem then is this. To paraphrase the words of the Wu-Tang Clan, <laughs> cash rules everything around us. Artist-run centers cannot afford to not accept funding from the councils and increasingly from private corporations and foundations. However, we, as art workers and artists, can equally not afford to solely produce work that reflects the agenda of our donors and funding bodies. Artist-run centers aren't unique to Canada. However, they occupy a more important position here culturally and are more numerous here, and especially in Montreal, where the majority reside, than anywhere else in the world. And this is primarily because of the influential and long-standing financial support system in place since the creation of the Canada Council for the Arts in 1957. Artist-run centers are, administratively, models of a more collectivist vision of Canada and its cultural economy inherited from that earlier era. In many respects, these models no longer correspond to the social and economic reality envisioned and produced by more recent federal administrations. And I believe that ultimately, while artist-run centers are underfunded and require more work on the part of the artist than any other exhibition model, their community-building potential validates their existence and encourages participation on a larger scale. I believe that it is this sense of fostering community that is responsible for the rich and internationally recognized arts output of Canada today. That artist-run centers are community spaces is an important argument for their continued support. But what should that support look like? In a recent blog post, Cheyenne Turians writes, and I quote, As I understand it, the impetus behind the formation of artist-run centers was artistic self-determination. Emerging in the late 1960s, arguments for self-determination were taken seriously, and the support of artist-run centers can be read alongside other social phenomena <coughs> of the time, such as the civil rights movement, second wave feminism, and anti-establishment counterculture. At this time, the infrastructure of the Canada Council already existed, and the Council's expansion to support artist-run initiatives reflects its, ado its adoption of the zeitgeist." End quote. So just to, to be clear, self-determination, and this is uh, coming from Cornell's law, self-determination denotes the legal right of people to decide their own destiny in the international order. Internal self-determination may refer to various political and social rights, but by contrast, external self-determination refers to full legal independence or succession for the given people in the larger political legal state." End quote. Instead of bending to the rapidly shifting policies of increasingly conservative political administrations, the Canada Council for the Arts should allow for self-determined mutual support to exist. This would manifest as funding flowing directly to the centers that can be allocated in the ways the centers see fit, an act of acceptance of self-government and self-determination that is ultimately more valuable than the small amount of grant money ever could be on its own. Today, this seems like a utopian demand. 
but it is rooted in the ideals that underpinned artist-run culture from its inception. So we must remember the work done by previous generations. Historically, the roots of artist-run culture position it as a direct response to the failure of the museum and the gallery system to respond to the needs of the artist. It is artist-directed culture that is responsible for instituting a minimum fee schedule, so CARFAC in Canada and wage in the US, for speaking about the specific barriers faced by women, uh, women artists in relationship to work and childcare, for building experimental exhibition platforms and cross-country networks, for fighting for subsidies and for building a myriad of other types of supports addressing needs ranging from affordable housing, so artist co-ops for studios and for living, and to healthcare. In developing answers within the artist-run center community, the desire to create working solutions to social problems is especially visible. Yet, like any other enterprise, artist-run culture is susceptible to some of the more negative aspects of institutionalization. In the process, it can fall into the trap of becoming a culture that supports some and not others. The micro-utopias that it generates have often proved to be short-lived. Some of the important strategies employed in the past such as some of the feminist and pro-diversity tactics, have more recently been abandoned by artist-run centers. As artist-run centers aged, so too did the councils, following a process that Turians identifies as mutual becoming. And I quote, a pervasive, a pervasive example of this practice of mutual becoming is a phenomena of organizational structuring and programming, both geared towards council mandates. That artist-run centers have boards of directors cannot be untangled from the Canada Council's dictate that they do so. That so many indigenous artists show work in artist run centers probably, unfortunately, cannot be divorced from the strategic priorities of funding bodies. Mutual becoming is an important consideration. It demonstrates the potential for the funders and beneficiaries to collectively develop a better environment or a more utopian future. However, it's equally important to acknowledge the absorption of radical tactics into the mainstream. Until all radical aspects are erased and replaced with projects of a neoliberal nature. Turians, quoting Diana Nemiroff, goes on to highlight how even the notion of artist-run centers as community spaces has been co-opted, or depending on how you look at it, informed by the language of the funding bodies. I quote, because the funding programs were community oriented, they encouraged artists to define themselves in practical terms as a community. This orientation in turn affected the ways in which the artist was able to perceive his or her role vis-a-vis -vis the larger community, end quote. So when put this way, it doesn't sound like such a problem, but it suggests a potentiality for the erasure of anti-establishment projects and erasure of resistance, a co-option of the artist run center as a parallel space now thrust into the spotlight. How then should we move forward in the future? Is a model based on self-determination compatible with an institutionalized and publicly or privately funded model? What strategies are in place or can be developed to make the current conditions more open to flourishing? And how can we alter our current blueprint to build a better future aligned with our very different values? What tactics do artist-run centers use in the face of neoliberal funding? How do, they do make, how do they make do on a human resource or programming level when faced with budget cuts? Many artist-run centers, current existence relies on non-monetized exchanges and unwaged labor. While some are funded at a level at which they can support paid staff, pay artist fees, rent or buy new equipment, and produce exhibitions, most struggle to make ends meet and resort to a diversity of tactics in the face of austerity, such as uh, selling what? Like, unlicensed alcohol at openings and events, and I'm sure many of you have benefited from that. Uh, the rental contracts to artists that have not passed through a jury, and there, there are more that we can name. What is worse, though, uh, than taking on these tactics is a way in which artist-run centers that function with small fund budgets have been documented and unjustly celebrated and mythologized as a means to reduce institutional support first and primarily by funding bodies, but now too by the centers themselves as they internalize the language and politics of the contemporary economic climate. How then do we resist? In 2014, Fuse Magazine, which for 38 years acted as a venue for timely and politically engaged publishing and programming, reflecting the diversity of the contemporary art world, not so quietly published its last issue. Prior to closing, the magazine, 
The editors, under the guidance of Gina Badger, a past Concordia grad also, published an issue that proudly proclaimed, do less with less, do more with more, borrowing from the work of Nicole Burrish and Anthea Black. The act of refusing to perform is an act of resistance. It is no longer sufficient to push against the system for performing, by performing minor acts of sabotage, nor can we continue to try to game the system. In order to qualify for funding and to be formally considered an artist rent center, we're supposed to follow the not-for-profit model, must not charge admission fees, must be non-commercial, and de-emphasize the selling of artwork. This model encourages, but does not demand, the exhibition of experimental artwork. However, with the decrease in government funding to the arts over the last two decades, many artist-run centers now charge admission fees for event-based programming, and they occasionally sell artwork, often through, um, through uh, auctions and things like that. We must stop working towards the end goal of reaching our independent revenue quotas for the councils, and instead work towards financing work which we are passionate about and which we can afford. This sometimes means doing less with less, but it always means providing the taxpaying public, the same taxpayers already financing our centers through their tax dollars, with art which interests them and in which they have a stake in. With less funding, or no increase in funding, fewer staff members can be employed at lower pay and with no prospect of a raise, resulting in low morale, high turnover, and general job dissatisfaction. The tactic used by centers is to hire staff through government-subsidized employment programs, which hire workers for short-term contracts. They pay 100% of a minimum wage salary and the wage levies for 30 hours a week for six months, and then contract these new employees to work for longer periods of time at a higher wage but for fewer hours per week. Another common tactic is to fire employees and then to rehire them or other people as contract workers, effectively eliminating the need to pay wage levies, saving the company money but not necessarily the employee. These are all technically legal tactics, um, or technically illegal tactics, excuse me, uh, but incredibly, incredibly common. And I say we should maybe carry on with this in regards to stretching out funding, but um, we need to make it work for us instead of working for it. We shouldn't be jeopardizing ourselves as workers in order to make ends meet. In terms of affecting programming, the precarity of funding means that short-term projects are often prioritized over long-term research programming. At some centers, major exhibitions are necessarily eliminated from the schedule due to lack of human and financial resources to manage these projects, and so instead opting for short-term ephemeral programming. While this allows artist-run centers to be more responsive to current issues, it effectively eliminates any art historical or true curatorial work by highly trained center work workers. Additionally, the shift in funding demands that centers program according to specific sets of guidelines in order to be eligible for grants. In having granting agencies dictate to centers, opposed to centers having the agency to decide what they want to program, the type of art exhibited to the public is at risk of becoming censored, less critical of the government, and or narrow in scope. By inverting the typical model and denying centers the agency to self-govern, Granting bodies, because of the government funders to which they are accountable, carry out the mandate of the current political administration. It's abundantly clear that the precarious conditions that artist-run centers currently operate under, and which are primarily caused by chronic underfunding, are detrimental to the long-term health of these centers and to the arts field in general. While artist-run centers have adapted to make do with less funding and fewer resources, the demands placed on them to access these slim services mount every funding cycle. While unwaged immaterial labor allows the centers to keep going, it also legitimizes the government's rationalization to underfund. It ultimately perpetuates the do more with less attitude that has become so commonplace. If we want to ensure a future for artist-run centers in Canada and for artist-run culture, we must both look back to their, most, their more socialist and utopian roots and beyond their capitalistic realities. We must speak to each other, our peers, but also to the councils directly. We must pressure the umbrella organizations like the Artist Front Centers Association of Canada and more locally, the RCAQ, to lobby for us at the national level. And we, Artist Front Centers, and their artists and employees, if we don't want to be shut down due to austerity measures, or to only support artists in line with Harper's or succeeding government policies, we must politicize as a collective and not as individuals. 
We must speak to each other and then loudly to those that provide support to our community. And we must demand the right to self-determination once again.